please. <coughs> Good afternoon. <coughs> Welcome to the Hudson Institute. For those of you who do not know me, I am Hussein Haqqani. I'm the director for South and Central Asia here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, this is our first public event of the year 2020, and it shows how much importance we give to Afghanistan that our first event is about Afghanistan. It's not just because uh, A comes first in the alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we aim to continue our focus on Afghanistan, which, as you know, has been significant for several years. Uh, 2019 was a uh, turbulent and busy year for Afghanistan. Uh, they had a presidential election, stalled negotiations with the Taliban, and there has been persistent speculation of US withdrawal. Uh, amid all this, uh, we have today gathered to launch and discuss a very important report from the Afghanistan Institute of Strategic Studies. Uh, the study assesses uh, the views of Afghans on political settlement and order in Afghanistan. It's a scientifically conducted survey, and I will, uh, will let the author uh, of the report, uh, which is available, by the way, for those of you who need and want it, um, to explain the methodology. Uh, it is based on a survey of 1,500 respondents in 34 provincial capitals across Afghanistan. Uh, there are many uh, Americans and others around the world who ask, what do we have to show for the last 19 years of American and Western involvement in Afghanistan? I would say that this survey and its results uh, answers that question. Uh, for example, most Afghans want a political system that is democratic, based on elections, guarantees civil and political liberties, and they certainly do not want to go back to the Taliban era. Uh, some of the key findings that I believe are worth noting include a significant majority of respondents, 75.3%, prefer elections as the best political mechanism for settling the current conflict between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban. So it's the Taliban who probably know that. They may not have much knowledge of uh, opinion polling, but uh, they certainly know how to read poll results uh, and also on-ground realities. Uh, other methods that have been proposed, such as power sharing through some kind of a uh, Zalmi Khalil Zad brokered uh, arrangement, uh, has 9% support. Decentralization of power has 1.8% support, and an interim government, again, to be brokered by foreign powers, has only 7.7% support. Uh, despite their considerable dissatisfaction with their government's ability in providing security, most respondents prefer the post-2001 political system compared to the Taliban's emirate. 80% of respondents support the post-2001 political structure. 70% uh, of respondents are clearly against a Taliban-style government, and the same number feel uncomfortable with the Taliban coming to power and the religious police watching their daily life. Now, these are interesting and important findings, and I'm sure that as we have uh, further discussions uh, during the course of our uh, this afternoon, you will realize that uh, the fact that a majority of Afghans also considers that a legitimate government requires bringing justice for war crimes. That's an important finding as well. And a lot of them, 78%, emphasize that a government comprising those involved in war crimes and the killing of civilians is not legitimate. So it's clear that the people of Afghanistan would like their political liberties to endure. Uh, the Taliban remain an insurgent group, and those of you who have attended previous events here uh, would know at least my views, which are rather unequivocal, uh, that the Taliban essentially are a foreign-supported insurgent group which would not have been able to last as long as it has done if it did not have a, a safe haven and if the American and NATO forces had focused on eliminating the safe haven before fighting the insurgents. Uh, since that wasn't done, we have had these 17 years of 
actually not a consistent policy, but 17 one-year policies uh, that each president and his advisor of the day kept on intru introducing for Afghanistan. It's important in this whole process to also take into account what Afghans believe. And so for that, this afternoon, I have with me Professor Yaqub Ibrahimi, who is the main author of the report on this survey. He's a research fellow at the Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies and a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimi's current research interests include international relations theory, international security, fragile states and conflict analysis with a special concentration on the Middle East and Afghanistan. He sits right next to me. Thank you. I have to take my papers. So. Please get your papers. <laughs> this, is, this is your cue to get your papers. <laughs> Next to him, of course, is Dr. Nazif Shahrani, who teaches in the Departments of Anthropology, Central Eurasian Studies, and Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department at Indiana University. Uh, Dr. Shahrani has conducted extensive field research in Afghanistan, Turkey, Pakistan, and Uzbekistan. And on the far right, not politically, just in terms of location on this particular podium, is Mr. Shweb Rahim who is a senior advisor at the State Ministry for Peace in Afghanistan. He has previously served as the acting mayor of Kabul, as well as senior advisor to the Minister of Defense. Uh, Mr. Rahim is a Fulbright Fellow, an Asian Society Fellow, and a Rumsfeld Foundation Fellow, and a Duke University alum. So let us let everybody around this panel uh, go ahead and give their views on the report. You go first, Dr. Ibrahim, <coughs> with the findings and the methodology, which I'm sure the audience is curious to know about. Thank you, Ambassador Akani. Thank you for the panel. And also, thanks to Hudson Institute for hosting this, the launch of this uh, uh, report. And thanks for the audience for coming. Uh, when, I, when I was thinking of the, the research design uh, several months ago, uh, on conflict resolution in Afghanistan. And I was uh, listening to the debates on political settlement. Uh, I realized that in the heart of this debate, there is a disagreement on the form of a political system in Afghanistan. So I realized that the current war between the government of Afghanistan <coughs> and the Taliban is mostly a conflict on the form of political order in a post-conflict uh, in a, in a post conflict setting rather than on uh, control over resources or political power in Kabul, etc. cetera. Uh, therefore, uh, it was very important to connect the debates between uh, the debates on political settlement with the debates on political order in Afghanistan. And it, it was not easy. It was not easy to do in one uh, uh, single research, but we tried our best. <clears throat> uh, both official statements by the government of Afghanistan and uh, the Taliban shows that uh, there is a clear political agenda uh, in the heart of the war uh, by both major, major parties to the conflict, uh, i.e. the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban, uh, having their, their, own, uh, uh, their own plan uh, for the form of government. For example, the government invests to uh, extend the current political system which emerged after the uh, 2001 uh, United States invasion of Afghanistan, which is theoretically based on a, a, a electoral democracy. In the Taliban propagates broadly their Islamic Emirate brand as an Islamic solution uh, to the problem of Afghanistan. So uh, this shows that the conflict is not only on the battleground, but it's a political conflict in the form of political regime for the future of Afghanistan. Therefore, without an agreement on the form of political system in Afghanistan, it is difficult to reach uh, an agreement on conflict resolution. Uh, this means that the question how to settle the conflict is systematically linked to, the, to what type of regime the parties to the conflict uh, are looking for and whether there are a sign of agreement on that or not. So in this survey, I put these two questions together and asked the people of Afghanistan that what they think. What is the best political option for settling the conflict and uh, uh, what they prefer as uh, their ideal political regime for the country? So in the survey, uh, uh, there are three concentration areas. 
first of all, people's views on political regime. Second, people's view, sorry. First of all, people's views on political settlement. Second, people's views on political regime or political system. And third, people's views on politi political legitimacy. Uh, what type of government is legitimate for the, uh, uh, from the people's view? So by political system, uh, I put forward four mechanisms uh, of settling the conflict. Uh, general elections that require the, uh, the participation of the Taliban or the insurgent groups uh, as political parties in the elections. Uh, interim government, which is uh, uh, particularly in the last months or uh, a part of uh, debates on political settlement in Afghanistan. Uh, power sharing, that requires giving the Taliban a number of ministries or political offices in Kabul and decentralization of power, uh, giving the Taliban autonomy in the areas uh, under their control. So of these four uh, mechanisms, uh, people preferred the first. So as uh, I don't want to re uh, repeat as uh, Ambassador Hakani mentioned that over 70% of the people thinks that election is the best uh, option for settling the conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, power sharing receives only 9%, interim government 8%, and decentralization of power 2% uh, support. Uh, this result uh, in the middle of debate on political settlement in Afghanistan is surprising because uh, given the, uh, the, the fraudulent elections, particularly the last two uh, presidential elections in Afghanistan 2014 and 2019, it, it's assumed that people might not uh, support this political system. So what is the alternative? Is the Taliban alternative to this flawed political system? People say no. Still they support this uh, 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 political system and also elections as, an, uh, as a mechanism of settling the conflict. Uh, the second concentration area again political system. So it, it, uh, I try to compare people's views on, uh, on autocratic forms of political systems versus democratic uh, forms of political system. Uh, so a number of elements of both regimes were uh, 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 included into questions and uh, people were asked whether they uh, 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 support uh, an electoral democracy for Afghanistan when the conflict is over or they prefer some kind of authoritarian regime. Uh, first of all, I compared people's view on uh, whether they support that post-2001 political system compared to Taliban's regime or not, given this uh, uh, flawed uh, elections or taking that in consideration. 68% say that they prefer, that still they prefer the post-2001 political system uh, to the Taliban. And 29% says they don't prefer it. Uh, interestingly, uh, on uh, other elements of democratic, uh, a democratic regime, uh, uh, like the civil and political rights and liberties, over 80% of the people, they believe that their ideal government in Afghanistan should respect and guarantee uh, civil and political uh, rights and liberties in Afghanistan, including the women's rights, uh, uh, women's uh, activities in the public sphere, uh, freedom of expression, uh, and the equality, of, uh, the equality of citizens, regardless of their uh, gender, uh, ethnicity or political affiliation. And finally, uh, uh, on election as a system of uh, electing, the, electing the head of the state. Uh, in Afghanistan, we have different, different methods of electing uh, head of the state. For example, we have lawyer jirgas that uh, when the hereditary systems of uh, uh, appointing the head of the state uh, was not working, Lloyd Jirgas emerged and uh, appointed uh, uh, head of, heads of the states. The election of Ahmad Shah Durrani, the so-called founder of uh, uh, modern Afghanistan, was elected through this Lloyd Jirga. And also we have systems of uh, religious assemblies. The head of the, the, uh, the Taliban's Emirate, Mullah Omar, was uh, elected uh, through this religious assemblies. And also we have uh, election of leaders through ethnic gatherings, which was the case mostly during the 1990s civil wars. Uh, and then we have elections in the post-2001 uh, era. So people were asked that what they prefer. 83% uh, said that they prefer the, uh, the, electoral 
they prefer the, the system of uh, electing the head of the state that has been the case in the post-2001 uh, era. That, is, that means that 83% prefer the uh, uh, electoral system in the country. Uh, and on political legitimacy, finally, uh, again, uh, we compared people's views on whether election produce a legitimate government for Afghanistan or not. If not, then what mechanism would produce a legitimate government for Afghanistan? Uh, again, uh, does Luya Jirga produce a legitimate government in Afghanistan? Uh, does uh, religious assemblies produce a, a legitimate government in Afghanistan? People said, no, election is the only method that we believe as a system that produce a legitimate government for Afghanistan. And 76% 70, uh, said that uh, election produce a legitimate government, while 19%, uh, only 19% said that it cannot produce uh, uh, legitimate government in Afghanistan. And I believe that this 19%, regardless of a number of the pro-Taliban respondents, uh, are affected by the last two presidential elections, uh, the, this flawed presidential elections, and their, their response are affected by that. And finally, as uh, Ambassador Hakani mentioned, I, uh, I also ask questions on uh, the combination of a legitimate government, whether those uh, 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 accused of war crimes, uh, if uh, a government compri whether a government comprised of those uh, 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 accused of war crimes is legitimate from people's view, in people's view or not, they said no. Uh, so 79% 70, say that if war criminals are in a government, it's not legitimate in our view. Overall, just one minute and I'm done. So when this, this findings, I think, uh, uh, are significant uh, for, pol uh, for politics in Afghanistan. At the same time, it challenged the conventional wisdom on Afghanistan and Afghanistan people's political views. Uh, so the conventional wisdom suggests that because of the tribal structure of the society, uh, uh, elections and uh, modern methods of electing the uh, leaders or forming the government is not uh, familiar for the people of Afghanistan. These methods are alien in the country. And this is one of the reasons that why elections not uh, uh, working in the country. So people don't know that. Uh, they rely mostly on uh, uh, tribal and domestic methods of political legitimation in electing the, the, the leaders. This finding uh, uh, challenge this uh, conventional wisdom. It suggests that uh, the people, has, the, the people have practiced democracy in election in the past two decades, and they have internalized the system. Uh, they have memories of uh, alternative methods of uh, 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 forming governments and uh, systems of legitimation. And they think that when they, when they think of this uh, 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 post-2001 uh, electoral system compared to the memories they have of other alternative forms, uh, it seems that people understand the system very well, and they, uh, regardless of how, uh, how, 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 how flawed the system is, how uh, has it failed to produce effective <laughs> results and effective government, still people think that it is the only option uh, uh, for work for them. And at the end, uh, I just want to mention that, of course, the findings of this research is uh, limited uh, only to people's views and uh, provincial capitals. It does not reflect people's views uh, 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 in rural areas and uh, conflict zones and also, uh, and also areas under the con control of the Taliban. And I am sure that a survey of uh, those uh, uh, views and people uh, beyond the uh, uh, big cities of Afghanistan uh, is required uh, to produce a comparative image of uh, rural versus uh, uh, urban uh, political view of the people on political system, political settlement, and political legitimation in Afghanistan. Of course, there are lots of details. I don't want to uh, take others' time, and uh, if uh, there are any questions, we don't discuss And people that. have been given copies of yeah. the report, so they can all read it. Uh, it's not uh, too long, so therefore it's quite readable. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Sharani. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to also thank the AIAS and Hudson Corporation for bringing us here together to discuss a very important uh, study. 
uh, as I was driving, I think, from Washington in PR, somebody was saying, Galileo has said, only things that are measured could be managed. And if that's true, we do need measuring a lot of things in Afghanistan, particularly political issues in political culture. The unfortunate part of what um, this measurement shows is that uh, when asked what is the future of Afghanistan, um, the answer seemed to be the same, is the past. And much of what this report really shows tells us Supposedly, from the perspective of Afghans, they want the same thing. This brings us to really the definition of madness. <laughs> that they keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. It's not going to happen. I think um, perhaps we need to ask different kinds of questions. And also, one important result of a study like this is um, the lack of appropriate political education in the country. Why everybody seemed to think that election is the only legitimate means for choosing political heads of state or anything else? Because this is what the system has been talking about for the last 18 years at least. And we could have, in fact, done something better to educate the people of Afghanistan in a way where they could have come to understand they do have alternatives. The system of centralized um, authoritarian regimes that we have had for the last century plus is not the only available alternative. Or decentralization, which nobody really knows what it means. Often, they equate that with federalism. A federalism, again, a system of governance. Uh, it's a system. It's, it's not, uh, nobody really talks about its principles. It's about structure. And they immediately, because, again, President Karzai and others publicly have opposed anybody who thinks of federalism is essentially, it, uh, what is the term, that unpatriot. Uh, he has said this publicly in front of um, microphones, that anybody who thinks of federalism is essentially uh, should be uh, recognized as unpatriotic and, and not acceptable. So there's plenty of uh, education, as it were, about the ills of one form of decentralization that is known in the country, and that's federal system. But nobody has really asked the appropriate question as to whether people of Afghanistan, instead of being decentralized, would they like to govern their own communities? What if you ask the question in terms of community self-governance? Would villages like to, which already they're doing it anyway, would like to govern their own affairs themselves? If they do, would they, would, would they like to also govern their own districts? Would they like to also govern their own provinces? You will have a, and I'm, I'm sure if you ask this question differently, you'll get a different kind of answer. And of course, the election principle will be still there. Would you like to elect the head of your village, which they do, they have done for ages? Obviously, often those elections have been are manipulated by the center. Center has been always part of the problem of Afghanistan and cannot be part of the solution in Afghanistan unless it's reimagined, restructured, and remanaged. We have uh, serious issues that we cannot continue to, to, to make the future of Afghanistan reflect its past in a mirror. That has been done enough. It's not going to work. And in my judgment, the way that the survey has essentially started its work is um, ethnic politics. The role of ethnic politics in power sharing in Afghanistan. This itself is part of the problem. Politicization of ethnicity started in the 1980s 
earlier it existed in the monarchy era, and it got maybe a little worse during the communist regimes. But it got even worse in the jihad era because the jihad era was also manipulated, or ethnicity was manipulated by Pakistan to create ethnic-based resistance communities and resistance groups. And 2001, the uh, uh, Bonn Agreement officialized and essentially give it a stamp of approval. And then it got constitutionalized, more or less, in 2004. The problem is not distribution of power among ethnic groups. This is how, how it is presented to us. If Hazaras had so many people in the cabinet, and Uzbeks had so many, and Pashtuns had so, and percentages have been worked out, then it will be a fair ethnic distribution of power in Afghanistan. And that's what this survey is also uh, essentially reflecting, because most of those who have been spoken to are um, ethnic Dalals. In Persian, those of you who know, Dalal is CRC. These are people who, who are essentially in a marketplace of uh, politics making deals with each other. And they're not people with ideas. They're not people with vision. They're not people with anything other than what can they extract. We are faced with a politics of extraction, economics of extraction, which again got utterly horrible in the last 10 years, 18 years of US presence in international communities there. Mm -hmm. So we need to ask ourselves, <coughs> what are the real problems of Afghanistan? That is, define the problem in its real shape and form. And once we do that, again, the Galileo principle, if you have defined, is in a way of measuring the nature of problem, then you can manage it. If we articulate it in a form that does not help us get anywhere with it, which has been done repeatedly over the years, we're not going to, we're not going to be able to help the people of Afghanistan. So the problem is not distribution of ethnic access to power, and power means essentially in Kabul, and in these, um, most of the institutional structures are created for individuals in, in Afghanistan. Even ministries, their numbers have been uh, to, to essentially deal with ethnic politics, rather than create institutions that would help solve the problems of Afghanistan, and that people will be invited or brought in to make the institutions work. Just two nights ago on, on either Tulu television or uh, TV one that I watched the news, some gentleman who had been the, uh, what is that, Mushawiri uh, Arshad, uh, the senior something, who, has been the, who was there they created an, an entirely new institution for him to head. That did not exist. You go and look at the government structure today in Afghanistan, and <clears throat> you, I, I guarantee that you'd find many, many institutions that were created for individuals. Our problem is person-centered politics in the country. We need to bring about transformation from person-centered politics to ideas to principles, to values, to institution-centered politics. This we could have done in the last 18 years. But much to my own horror is an American citizen who also is binational, Afghan one, that they, us, Americans, did not do anything to bring this transformation in Afghanistan. We have a constitution with beautiful rights section human rights, ethnic rights, everything has, uh, in the Constitution is wonderful. But where it has failed is the executive structure of the Constitution. Essentially, assuring and reaffirming person-centered nature of politics in Afghanistan, and giving the, the appointment. One of the worst diseases in Afghanistan is, and I'll finish that, is the right of the president and high government officials to appoint people. You appoint in a kin-based society, person-centered society, it's normal 
It's accepted. And Afghans would even tell you if you survey them, it's OK. You appoint your kinsmen first. And then your friends, then your cronies, and then you sell. How can we, how can we get rid of this? Only by getting rid of the rights of appointment. And the only way it can be done is through recruitment on the basis of skills. On the basis, and you have to not only create this, mm -hmm. uh, these presidents have created, uh, created these, another institution in, at the center for recruitment. That's no recruitment. Recruitment needs to be done by the offices themselves, the people that they need, and the talent they require, not appointment by somebody from um, Kabul. And there are many other real issues that the country is faced with. And certainly, these kinds of surveys help us. But I think we need to have, we need to also start educating our own public in a way through media that is all now pervasive to imagine an alternative ways of governance. And that governance can, can be decentralized by defining the functions of central government and identifying what they are. And I have published on this list of various things. But more importantly, allowing for community self-governance at all levels, the village, district, province, and also national. And that we need to reimagine both vertical structures of the government, but also the horizontal ones. Without that, we're not going to be able to really uh, change anything in the future of the country, except to repeat the same madness of the past. So I'll, I'll stop there, and maybe we'll have Good. Um, of course, uh, so uh, one takeaway that I have from your remarks, which we can discuss later in the course of the discussion, is that somehow the US uh, exported its own political experience of having an executive-centered system, although there is a, check in, a system of checks and balances, which some would argue is not working very well or doesn't always work very well, uh, and uh, the spoil system, where the people who are elected to high office end up appointing a lot of people, uh, sort of, uh, and, and, and that does not sit well with the current situation in Afghanistan, if anything, it actually ends up creating uh, disruption in the ability of uh, the government to provide the services that the people need. We will come back to that. Mr. Rahim, your turn. And I hope you will address the element of the survey that talks about who is the impediment to mm -hmm. a peace settlement. Because I think that both Dr. Ibrahimi and uh, Dr. Sharani actually did not cover that aspect. All right, I'll try my best. Thank you very much. On behalf of the State Ministry for Peace of Afghanistan, I'd like to thank uh, Afghanistan Institute of Strategic Studies for this uh, national survey. Um, I think the survey is far more crucial than we give it credit. Once um, it'll play into a lot of the decision making, and I hope it does. And I would I'll, uh, also like to thank the Hudson <coughs> Institute for the platform of launching this survey. Um, what I'm going to talk about related to the survey is trying to give a bit of context to what these figures actually mean, what these answers mean, and what kind of underlying narratives they support um, or undermine. And I'm going to try to answer the question in the next eight minutes, nine minutes, which I have. Um, what shapes? the Afghan narratives on peace? I think this question is not researched and looked into enough, particularly by Americans. Um, and this is important because the peace process, or whatever you want to call it at this point, it's not a peace process yet, many would argue, um, <coughs> is designed based on a few fundamental assumptions. And those assumptions are not widely accepted in Afghanistan. And I think this survey challenges those assumptions as well, as uh, Professor Ibrahim mentioned at the end of his, um, end of his speech. Um, I think that if we do not look into this question, we risk failure of any political solution that will result from the current ongoing process in Doha, which will lead to the inter-Afghan negotiations. 
Um, and I think that we want to make sure that any kind of withdraw withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan needs to be a responsible withdrawal. We need to avoid <coughs> or reduce the risk of irresponsible troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think what shapes various Afghan narratives on peace? I think there are three major reference points that shaped the various narratives within Afghanistan. There are, there are some minor ones, but um, I think these three are the most important. <coughs> the first one is <coughs> the new Afghanistan, which is from 2001 till the present. The second reference point is the bond process, which is uh, from December 2001 till about 2004, after the Constitution was ratified and we held our first presidential elections, and the various interpretations of the bond process, because people take, uh, learn different lessons from this process. And third, last but not least, is the Geneva Accords of 1988, which essentially set the stage for the withdrawal of um, the Soviet Union's troops from Afghanistan. So on the first issue of the new the new Afghanistan, 2001 to present. So what makes the new Afghanistan different? I think three fundamental characteristics make the new Afghanistan different from before. First is how the head of state is elected. For the first time in our country's history, the head of state is directly elected by the people. This essentially, by design, shifted the center of gravity of power from the elite to the masses. That was at least the intention. And what this did was this activated uh, the masses and the population, regardless of how flawed the system was, regardless of the level of corruption, regardless of the disputes. The conversation of power included the general population for the first time in our history. And I think this, this in essence, changed the nature of politics in Afghanistan. And this needs to be recognized. Second is greater regional and international exposure. Our country has never been as exposed to uh, various value systems, never has had the opportunity to educate ourselves <coughs> and our families um, as before. And so what, that's, what this has resulted in is it has resulted in the creation of more relevant social and political values, uh, more in line we're trying to, basically, we're, trying to, we're, we're catching up with the world. We were more isolated, now we're more exposed, so we're trying to adjust and align ourselves. Third is the issue of rights and civil liberties. Now, regardless of the level of conflict and crime in a country, whether the state and the constitution and the laws by design protect certain rights or not, is a new idea in Afghanistan. And the constitution, with you know, its pretty words that Dr. Sharani mentioned, those pretty words did not exist before. And so people complain and are frustrated about the lack of law enforcement, the weak nature of the state being able to um, uh, secure those rights. But in essence, we recognize the significance of those laws being there. So these three, these three traits have resulted in a new Afghanistan. And in a new Afghanistan, which answers questions of this survey very differently and challenges the conventional wisdom. So this has led to a narrative on the peace process that you cannot reverse this progress. This is one of the biggest things that the new Afghanistan is saying. We will not accept a reversal. We want progress. We don't want to go back to the Taliban days or the old days. Um, I'd also like to uh, say that it is my belief, and it is our belief, that this narrative is not urban-centric. It is much wider in the rural areas of Afghanistan than many would like to claim. And I would also welcome surveys extending to rural areas uh, to demonstrate this. Um, the third and most important part of the narrative of the new Afghanistan on peace is the issue that the republic is the provider and the guarantor of our civil rights. And so protecting the republic and the survival of the republic becomes a key feature of the narrative that exists. Unlike the loya jirga or other religious methods which the survey also alludes to. The government and President Ghani's 
narrative on peace is built on the new Afghanistan. Number two, the bond process from 2001 to 2004. So, what the bond process essentially did was it hit the reset button. It hit the reset button, and it was designed to allow for a transition from chaos and conflict to order and some, some sort of a political order, regardless of how, you, how one feels about it. Because the Taliban were defeated, they were not sitting on the table, and the Mujahideen, headed by President Rabbani at that point, agreed and for the first time, peacefully transferred power to um, President Karzai under this bond process. So what happened? What are the features of this process? The, one of the big features of the bond process was that during the bond negotiations, there was no primary side. All sides were considered equal. Nobody had more of a claim, necessarily. Two, everything was up for grabs. No constitution, no previous army, no previous international treaties. We, they were bound by nothing. And so they got together, and whatever came out of that uh, process shaped the new political environment and realities of the country. This is why this narrative is very heavily favored by the Taliban. That's why they say, like, we are not going to talk to the Kabul regime or even after we signed the Doha agreement with the United States government, we will talk to the Afghan government as one of the parties among many. Because this narrative is taken from how Bonn was designed. And surprise, surprise, the political figures who benefited from the Bonn process also prefer this. Because now this is an avenue to gain more relevance and to make sure they come back in the limelight. So this, the, Bonn, the Bonn process specifically shapes a lot of the political posturing of political figures, particularly uh, um, non-government. And I think this needs to, this needs to be uh, studied a lot. But the general population is against this narrative because of the very same features. Because it undermines the gains of the past 18, 19 years, the Constitution, everything is up for discussion. And the new Afghanistan is not comfortable with that. So this is where you have a clash. The third reference point is uh, the Geneva Accords of 1988. A colossal failure um, in the eye of Afghans. A failure which essentially meant that um, the two major signatories, which was uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, witnessed by the United States and the USSR, Ambassador Haqqani would know this far better than, far better than me. Um, the agreements were reneged. They were not upheld. And essentially, essentially what it meant was, this, the Geneva Accords 1988 was an irresponsible process. The design was flawed. It did not secure a smooth transition of power. It created a vacuum. And it, it led to the eventual collapse of the state, and civil war ensued, and we all know the rest. So the, the Geneva Accords drives a lot of the public pessimism on current US efforts. People draw parallels. And unfortunately, when we see signs that are similar to the negative elements of the Geneva Accords, people do not trust those measures. Um, I think that uh, President Ghani, one of the um, comparisons that is drawn is that uh, President Ashraf Ghani is compared to Dr. Najibullah of the time. But I think that comparison is flawed because a lot of the decisions being made is to avoid the repetition of what Dr. Najib went through. So in the end, what is my, what is my appeal? My appeal is that the brilliant minds in this room and anybody potentially watching, research these reference points to try to understand why people of Afghanistan feel the way they feel about the peace process. And I think that the conventional wisdom on Afghanistan is not good enough. And if we expect 
if we expect any political settlement to be sustainable and to avoid chaos, we need to um, learn from our past. And I'd like to think that these three reference points might be a good starting point. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, before I open it to the floor, I have a quick round of questions for everybody here, but a couple of quick comments. Uh, one comment to Shwe Ibrahim's uh, point uh, about the Geneva Accords. The Geneva Accords had two sets of flaws. One set of flaws was that they were between a government that was supposed to collapse as a result of those accords, the Afghan government, and the other government, which actually was not a protagonist in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And the agreement was about the withdrawal of Soviet forces. And the American and the Soviet agreement was that the Soviets should leave, which was the American goal. Uh, the Soviets left and without agreement on what would happen after. So because there was no agreement on what would happen after, Pakistan's role became larger than life. The Americans, of course, were no longer interested because the Soviets had left and the Afghans were thrown to the wolves. So two sets of problems, what was agreed upon, could not be implemented because those who were formally agreeing upon something on that were not necessarily the parties. The Mujahideen were not a party, Pakistan was. And the Afghan government that was the party was meant to dissolve itself or end as a result of all of this. So, so that was it. It was a, basically what it was, was, and I hope that nothing like that is repeated, was the creation of a myth of an agreement so that the Soviets could leave. Yeah. And so if the same thing is done so that the Americans could leave, peace will not come to Afghanistan and it will still have implications because they'll come back and bite uh, all parties concerned. Because after all, one of the consequences of the civil war in Afghanistan was the war in Chechnya and the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, erstwhile Soviet Union and in Russia subsequently, because many of the Chechens ended up fighting in Afghanistan. So, so these things are interlinked and people in this town right now are in a strange mood in Washington, D.C. No one wants to look at interlinkages of anything. Uh, everybody looks at everything from only a very partisan political point of view, and it's all about so what. Uh, well, there is a lot of so what, and so thank you for pointing that out. Second, the rural-urban configuration. The survey is, and this is a big criticism that many people have already sent to me, rural pop uh, urban population is only 25%, 75% is rural, what? Those figures are disputed, I think. Yes. It's, well, anything, it's everything is level, disputed. Right? Maybe 27%, 28%, but it's certainly not more than one third, right? Would you agree with that? Uh, I, as the mayor of Kabul, I would not. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, I think, okay, I'm, I'm I, glad. I'm, I'm glad to be educated because in a lot of places, I mean, those are the last available numbers. I think the running... 2017. Under, if, I, if I just may very quickly, the running understanding on the development and practitioners within Kabul and within Afghanistan is a 50-50. 50-50. Okay, fair mm -hmm. enough. Fair enough. Even in that case, there's half the population that is left out of the survey. And, but, but you believe, Rahim, that, uh, uh, that it is, uh, that the rural views will not be too different from the others. Yes. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Second point I have is that Afghanistan has a very young population. 18.8 mm -hmm. .8 is the median age. Yes. And if that is the case, then more than, I mean, almost half of Afghanistan's population actually has been born under the new order. Mm -hmm. So therefore, those who keep harking back to old historic arguments need to take that into account. And maybe this survey does bring to, does highlight the fact that young Afghanistan has a very different view. Old Afghanistan may have liked a foreign brokered settlement, like the bond process, like the Geneva Accords. Young Afghanistan says, what the heck? We have a life. We want to carry on with our life. And we are not interested in somebody who left our country 40, 50 years ago to study and never came back, trying and telling us how to sort of divide power between people from his age group once again. Uh, we, we want to say in what, 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 what happens in Afghanistan. So that is an important element as well. Um, and then there is this one point I tried to give the bait to all of you, none of you took it. So I'm going to read it out of the survey myself. When asked about who they viewed as the main obstacle to a political settlement, 34% of respondents blamed Afghanistan's eastern neighbor. Those of you who know geography know who that is. 24% blamed the Americans. 
and 20% blamed the Taliban. How much of it is just nationalism? No, 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 we are not blaming our, our people, even though the Taliban are, and they are blaming the two external actors. Any one of you who wants to take any of my comments before we go to the audience? Most uh, certainly, I think the um, combination of uh, views of uh, Pakistan being obstacle as well as Taliban, if you put the two together, it gives you a different figure and that there's not much difference. Um, in terms of external um, obstacles, I think the survey shows pretty well um, that these two forces are critical in, in lack of progress anyway. But there are also internal issues within Afghanistan that uh, the survey is not perhaps um, indicating those as clearly as, as could have been um, okay. you know, highlighted. So um, if I may just add on to that, um, I think <clears throat> modern conflict resolution experiences demonstrate that when the conflicting side has safe havens and sanctuaries mm -hmm. outside the border, it's very hard for any sort of settlement to work. And the most recent experience being the Colombian experience, where sure. after Hugo Chavez's commitment and Venezuela being on board, the, the, were the FARC actually uh, interested? because they had no alternative. And so I think the survey speaks to that, and the general population recognizes that. As, unless we have Pakistan on board, well, you know, chances are low. OK. Um, audience, questions, and very short comments. I will take comments, but they have to be very, very short. So it is, it is a test of your skill if you can keep your comment to 30 seconds. And a question, of course, is what has a question mark at the end and requires an answer. Speeches are not allowed. Yes, sir. Short introduction of yourself, please. Okay, uh, oh, okay. Um, Pat Spann, uh, retired government. I actually was in Kabul in June of '03, and um, uh, I guess one of the, one of my concerns with that area is that um, it, it seems like there's not an interest in a strong central government. Is there any any movement to have a, a regional federation with with uh, you know of of uh, somewhat regional autonomy and um, not necessarily a, a strong a strong central government that seems to be what the West what the US pushes it's not um, there is no movement mm -hmm. yet anyway for any such thing but there are some mentions of local autonomy Auton not so much I mean it's not the question of autonomy in the sense of different regions running completely their own affairs, managing their foreign affairs, uh, you know, borders and all the rest. Uh, the idea is for the country to have a federal government, a central government that manages certain aspects of country's affairs. You know, one of the points I think Ambassador made is uh, about the United States basically taking its own model and imposing it in Afghanistan. It actually is not so. America, America's uh, governance structure from outside is misunderstood for the most part because the only thing they see is what Washington does. Yeah, they don't see local they government do not they don't see, see yes. state government. Absolutely. This country is run you. on the basis of community self-governance. Every community governs itself domestically. If America in fact had taken its model, and this is something that we don't do, and we should be doing, we should be pursuing that. Sharani, then we would it, have a different kind of structure. Isn't an impediment to that in Afghanistan a lack of local or indigenous resources? I mean, for example, the American model of local self-government is also every government more or less funds itself. So considering that after the collapse of everything, mm -hmm. uh, which result, you know, and especially after the end of the Taliban rule, there was definitely a very small base from which one could collect taxes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, to have, so 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 so, isn't that one part of the problem? Well, uh, there can be a solution. That is, yes, we are essentially relying on external sources to run mm -hmm. our government. Now and and sorry, and external resources will can more easily flow to a central government than they can fl yes. flow to community governments. Then the central government can have a formula sure. for distribution and allocation or reallocation of those funds to local communities. But 
the system, the way it is structured, will not allow that. Because this is, this is uh, extractive politics. And once uh, in its, its scene is a prize. If you win your prize, you're not going to give it to anybody. You're going to hold on, you know, tooth and claw. And that's exactly what happens. So there has to be some reimagining, you know, a new vision for um, creating in multi-ethnic societies after conflict uh, governance structures that would, in fact, be effective in solving real serious problems. And that, that is not being done. That's what I'm talking about, political education. We need to educate as well as um, perhaps encourage those who have essentially gotten everything that came to the country and pocketed it to uh, perhaps sit aside so, and let that, and that's it, I'm sorry, the last point I want to make is the younger generation in Afghanistan are being prevented by the existing structures to have any kind of role in the governance of the country for, for now. Unless so, there is some kind of you know, constructive destruction of the existing structure, they have no chance. The Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction the report is being discussed, their comments and criticisms. And among them is the fact that, you know, warlords were included in government, a lot of money was thrown in on the assumption that it will that, that the money will itself somehow sort of, you know, it's like throwing a seed and sort of the plants will take root and grow. Uh, that didn't happen, and as you pointed out, it created an extractive political system which then militated against Afghans mm -hmm. finding some of those local self-governance uh, as sort of uh, tools that they probably had before, because mm -hmm. even under the monarchy, Afghanistan was not completely centralized in governance. You were going to say something, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, <clears throat> on centralization or decentralization of the country, the, the question, first of all, is that why we have the centralized government in a post-9-11 Afghanistan, right? So uh, I think this is actually a response to decentralization of power during the 1990s. Afghanistan was uh, 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 divided in, in sex zones, and it was self-governed. Well, that, like that was factionalization said, rather than, yeah. rather than right. decentralization. Right. Uh, yeah. That was not centralization. It was uh, factionalization. Yeah. Factions, yeah. Yep. And, uh, Fragmentation. Uh, and even when the Taliban emerged, right, uh, in, uh, in Kabul, partly they were welcomed by the people because of this, uh, this mass that was happening in the 1990s. And uh, so the, the Mujahideen government in Afghanistan, they were mostly based on ethnic, uh, 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 ethnicized political structures. And they thought, okay, the north should go to Nan Pashtuns and south goes to the Pashtuns in central port, uh, in central port to the Hazaras and in, uh, in, uh, in, in northwest to the Uzbeks. So uh, this is the imagination of actually a federal system or a decentralized system that the new generation of Afghanistan has in mind, and it's very broadly propagated by the state as well. Uh, uh, and the, one of the reasons that why they say that uh, 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 talking of a federal system is not a patriotic uh, kind of speech is because we have another alternative image of decentralization, and that is the uh, 1990s, which never happened, at least in, uh, in, modern, uh, in modern Afghanistan. There was always a sense mm -hmm. of centralization. Uh, so I think that uh, as far as this image is, uh, in the center, this image of decentralization of power or in destruction of the system in the 1990s, there will be always justification for, for centralization of power. So talking of a federal system uh, should be linked also to that, 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 that why this type of uh, uh, ethnic-based uh, division of power uh, uh, beyond Kabul uh, did not lead to uh, uh, an effective uh, state and even destroyed all uh, uh, infrastructures. Dr. Sharani? There were these regional power structures that emerged, with the exception of Kandahar, mm -hmm. which eventually Taliban brought about order there. <clears throat> but everybody was fighting for the control of Kabul, the capital. So in that situation, what was needed was a central government that would be willing to work with these regional structures in a way, again, having a vision to create a central government that had specific functions and did not interfere with the management of local affairs as much as this central government has been doing in the previous central governments have been doing. 
So okay. it's not, it, you know, that, that was not well, something for which a central government had to be the, created. The consequences of war, <clears throat> obviously, uh, disrupt societies sure. and, 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 and governing structures. Historically, Afghanistan was seen as a relatively weaker state, but a stronger nation. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so uh, what ended up after 9-11 is that there was an effort to try and build the state as strong as well, mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily building up uh, the national nationalism in the same manner. And that's probably something that will have to be done by Afghans. Mm -hmm. And I think Afghans are willing to do it uh, as, as they move forward. Question here. Yes. Um, There's a mic coming to you. Okay. Introduce yourself and ask the question. Okay. Thank you. I'm Nasreen Gross. I'm a women's rights activist in Afghanistan. And it's just about a few weeks since I returned from Kabul. Um, I have two questions from Mr. Yaqubi, and I have a comment. The panelists may comment on what I say. Um, my two questions are, um, how did you define the Taliban? That's a big uh, question mark in Afghanistan. Almost every group has a different definition of who the Taliban are. Um, and the other question I have is about your last question about the war criminals. Did you put a list of who you mean by war criminals? And if you did, did you include the Taliban as also war criminals? That Those are the two questions I had. The comment I have is that, of course, I've just come from Kabul, and the hot, hot, hot topic is elections and especially election fraud. And most Afghans that I know think that if you bring another government, elected government, based on fraud, whatever peace agreement you come up to, you have actually cut off the two feet of that peace process. No peace process will succeed in Afghanistan if you are presenting another government in Afghanistan that is based on fraud. And I'm wondering Thank you. none of you talked about it. Actually, I think, I think there was conversation about mm -hmm. that. I think Mr. Uh, 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 Yaqub Ibrahimi himself mentioned about the flawed well, elections. Yeah. I'm so glad anyway. to meet him because Ashi. his ministry is about two weeks old. <laughs> Six months, but two Six weeks since months. the approval, yes. Okay, go ahead. So <coughs> anybody who wants to address any of these, uh, the, the, both the comments and the questions. Okay, uh, I will answer the first two questions and I leave the uh, uh, election fraud to uh, other colleagues. Uh, on the definition of the Taliban, so yeah, uh, there is a methodological chaos on the, the, since the 9-11. Uh, even in the Western media, they were labeled as a terrorist organization and slowly uh, changed to an insurgent group and finally to uh, the, uh, the militant opposition of the government. Right? Uh, in this uh, survey, my approach is that an uh, insurgent group that, uh, that, that, that commits, uh, commits terrorist, uh, terrorist actions and in, uh, in insurgent uh, operations. Uh, they have uh, cross-border sanctuaries and they have a clear agenda for, uh, for, for taking the autonomy and uh, uh, power in the uh, country. Uh, on war criminals, yes, I, uh, 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 everyone is included in this, particularly in the, uh, the uh, post 9-11. Uh, uh, the survey has not, of course, uh, named uh, or, or provide a list of uh, groups involved in war, war crimes, but the government elements and anti-government elements. That includes that uh, war crimes committed uh, probably by uh, government forces, by uh, foreign troops uh, in support of the government, by the Taliban, and by many other uh, terrorist uh, groups that are based in Afghanistan. And I would argue that victims of war crimes usually know who the war criminals are. Mm -hmm. um, anybody commenting on the election? Yeah, uh, just very briefly. I agree. <clears throat> a government with a weak mandate will have a tough time reaching a political settlement. That's a given. But we have to look at 
what our options were. The discussion before President Trump's September 8th tweet calling off the peace negotiations in Doha, the discussion was whether or not to hold the presidential elections. Now, your argument in that scenario would be extended. Without an, elect without an elected government, regardless of the percentage of participants, we would essentially downgrade the state to the level of the Taliban. You would have no leverage. You would have no legitimacy. So the fact that elections were held, voter turnout was low. Different people have different reasons for it. But the parliamentary elections just held about seven, eight months ago before was extremely disputed. It hurt public trust. But the comparison is between compromising the election, having a non-elected state, versus having an elected state. But I completely agree that the stronger the mandate is, the higher chance of delivery from the state. But I think, I think I would say that while that is a good answer, it's not a completely satisfactory answer uh, for the simple reason that the question that the mandate that is not legitimate is a different subject than a weak mandate. A weak mandate is not enough people showing up <coughs> to vote. A question of legitimacy. So I think that needs to, th there needs to be some political consensus in Kabul about what constitutes a legitimate mandate. And I have been talking about that to my friends in Kabul for ages, that you have to figure it out. But I guess certain things take a much longer time to figure out than, than others. There are a few people who have questions. You may come back to your That's point fine. after I just that. Want to make a point right here, that. and then I'll come to you in a minute. First here, right here. Would be we always talking about the Afghan government, the bad guys are the Taliban, and we are the good guys, the Americans. But in fact, I've been part of the government and worked with the government for 10 years. Part of the problem is the Afghan government itself. From the Bonn conference, and if you go also before, even the, I think the last government, it was not the good government, but the good, last government probably in Afghanistan that has a central power was Najibullah. And, and maybe a part of that is still the Taliban had it. But the, the government which has started in Bonn Conference until today is ex, every three months is in ministries is resigning, is every six months is in, in deputy ministries is, is going away. This government has not been as a government. And that's all, also our problem that we are looking as a one okay. government. My question is, uh, is another one. And I'm, Sure that Shraib may be not going to answer this, but at least others. Um, we're going with the, the communication with the government, uh, with, with the Taliban. Let's say the peace process is approved and they are coming into the government. Their position is not like a Golbadin to come in Kabul and just have a, go to the Tulu News and a talk and have only two bodyguards. They want something more, including the fo change of form of the government. But are we agree on that? And what our uh, borderline is to change the current form of government to the Taliban? Well, I think that the, 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 the survey shows very clearly that the Afghan, <coughs> the overwhelming majority of Afghan people do not want a change in government. And I think that will be a strong sticking point. Usually such negotiations about, you know, grievances if the, uh, of, of uh, insurgencies, etc., are addressed, but nobody actually ever negotiates to say, okay, we will stop existing as a state and a government. Uh, the Taliban's view is a very different view of what they want. And I don't think that is acceptable to anybody who is not Taliban themselves, but any of the panelists who want to say anything about it. Brahimi first, Sharani. Just, <coughs> just, I, I think there is a very clear point uh, in making that, that distinguishing between uh, the Taliban and any other insurgent group who had fought in the past or will fight in, uh, in the future, and that the Taliban uh, do not want to come to power in this system or be part of it. Of course, they what, want what they over. want is they want to change the game. They want to change uh, uh, the rule of distribution and balance of power in the way that uh, uh, the government emerged, 
So this is this is fundamentally different than what Hikmatyar said. Uh, what right. what Hikma, Hikmatyar was up, up to. Or anybody else, yeah. not only just Hikmat, <coughs> you, you, usually people want to, people feel right. that they have been excluded from the power structure mm -hmm. and they want to come. Yeah. They don't want to come into the power structure, they want to change the power structure and the, and the very concept between an Emirate and a, and, 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 and a Republic or, or for that matter. And the people anything. don't want it. And the people certainly don't want it. Yeah. Want you can also address the earlier yes. point that I stopped you from, from making at that moment. Well, um, I just wanted to uh, bring the Afghanistan papers and its implications to the question that you've raised. It's not Afghans who have the privilege of making decisions about what their future political system will be. External forces have tremendous power in doing so. And part of the problem is the existing government for the last 18 years. Robert Gates, in his memoirs, had said a very profound uh, thing. In 2011, he visited Kandahar. And he was uh, having a meeting with the brother, the late brother of Karzai at that point. And then uh, his commanders tell him, generals, you know, what's going on. His statement was that the United States and Afghanistan has two options. One is kleptocracy, and the other one is mullahs, or what do you call it, the theological thugocracy. So which one was going to be the option? He said the kleptocracy, so the thugocracies, not the mullocracy, would be better for America. And they're going to support Karzai and his regime for whatever it is. And of course, they have been continuing to support those regimes, and we have reached this point of the worst kleptocracy ever. So uh, th this is the reality. Unless the United States and external forces are helping the Afghans, particularly the young generation of Afghans, to have an impact in deciding their own future, in the future of the country, there is no hope of things changing, that we will, our, our future will be essentially the same as our past, as I mentioned. We are coming uh, to sort of the close of our time. So your answer, and then one more question from the end, and then we have to close. Go ahead. Um, it's a very important question. The general, it's, a, it's been a year. The Afghan population is currently going through a phase of introspection. We're asking important questions which, which we've never asked before. Questions like, how important is this whole democracy business for us anyway? Do laws matter? Does the Constitution matter? Does this electing thing really, do I really care about it or not? We're forced to now answer these questions. And people have different opinions, people have different answers. So when you ask a question, assuming I won't answer, I will answer, but I don't have the answer. I don't think this decision can be made behind closed doors by a number of elite politicians. It is the State Ministry for Peace and the Afghan government's position that any fundamental decision on peace has to be made by the public. We can no longer afford an elite bargain like the bond process. This is essentially the fundamental philosophical difference between our government and the current method of how the negotiations are going on. And if I may add, the elite bargain uh, a la Bonn, there's another dimension to it. Uh, at the time of Bonn, uh, most, most of Afghan's elite had been driven out of the country. So what you were doing was you were trying to find sort of people who were willing to go back to Afghanistan and put it together from the diaspora, uh, which is not the situation now. You have these uh, this young Afghanistan that has been there, is there, and have grown up there. Maybe some of you have come out and studied abroad and gone, gone back, but, but you're very much rooted there. And you're not like the, uh, the sort of diaspora elite with illusions or, or, or ideas about when their grandfather was a minister in the time of King Amanullah or things like that. All of that has changed. Even the ethnic uh, makeup has changed. Uh, the, 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 there was a time when the demographics were different. The demographics have changed. So all of those realities 
will have to be born in mind instead of trying to broker bond two. This cannot be bond two. This has to be a very different type of mm. agreement. It is very important that it should be a different type of agreement. Last question I already conceded to you, so please go ahead and ask it. Please, we can't see you from here. You're sitting too, you're hidden in the, uh, in the yeah. And the question is? Your uh, name is? Utsab. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to ensure and anybody can answer this, that post peace process and once there has been a decentralization as we are looking at it, Afghanistan or parts of Afghanistan will not return back to the pre-2001 era where radical Islamic groups will be finding safe havens for their global agenda. Pakistan. That's my answer. My answer is we can ensure it if Pakistan is fully on board. If we, if we do not have the regional stakeholders, and unfortunately, after the whole Soleimani fiasco, now Iran is also, their posturing is becoming slowly a bit more destructive. So regardless of the centralization or decentralization, the endurance of any settlement requires a control of regional intervention. <clears throat> And the past 40 years, it's been our eastern neighbors. Now it might be a bit of the western. So we need to figure that piece out. Well, I think we have had quite a substantive discussion and are taking a lot of food for thought with us uh, home. Uh, the bottom line remains that we now have a uh, empirical study of at least the urban opinion. And I stand educated that the uh, urban population is estimated to be half of Afghanistan, not a quarter as a pre previously understood. And then we have these various perspectives. We didn't agree on everything, which is always a good thing. But we do all agree on the need for peace in Afghanistan and for having a peace process that results in peace, not just the illusion of peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.